raised or brought to the notice of public policy makers. It is in that very context that we requested uh, Dr. Ravi Chandra Singh uh, to come and present his PhD research, which finally took a shape in a book uh, on Northeast. So we thought it's very, very good that we have at least a book length, good research on Northeast. Now, uh, to chair the session today, we have Professor Bez Barua. Bez Barua is an expert at Egro Foundation and a friend of Egro Foundation. He is a professor in head department of economics, Guwahati University. He has published extensively five books to his credit, 50 papers in journals, 28 articles in edited volumes. He has held several important positions. Uh, he was a member of ICSSR for three years, director in the board of Assam Power Distribution Company Limited, member of the RBA Committee on Financial Sector Plan for Northeast Region, which was chaired by uh, Usha Thuret, who was the Deputy Governor of the RBI, and director in the board of directors of the Assam Industrial Development Corporation for a long time, from 2001 to 2005. He was member of the Advisory Committee for Preparation of the Human Development Report, Assam. He has completed his Master's in Economics from Delhi School, and Doctorate of Philosophy from Guwahati University. And to chair the session today, we are inviting Professor Bees Barua to take over and conduct the proceedings. Thank you very much. I hope I'm now clearly heard. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, uh, actually, this uh, foundation, you grow foundation, is doing a yeoman service to the you know to the discipline of economics as is being sort of you know sort of discussed and taken forward in India by you know I mean uh, this is primarily you know most of the work is carried out I understand by Dr. Charan Singh and so we are grateful to him for having you know people from diverse people you know who are quite famous and who are, who, are, who are not so famous but all working in diverse areas fields and all that so here they have given a platform a forum for all these people to you know share their findings their knowledge so that it becomes a you know uh, info, uh, knowledge dissemination and sharing platform and this is serving uh, a great uh, i think it's, it's providing a great service to the country and its various parts like the northeast uh, having said that, you know, uh, uh, this topic, of course, uh, which is the you know, economic growth and employment uh, linkages in the Northeast uh, region of the country, it may sound a little innocuous initially, but let me assure you, it's, go it's going to be extremely uh, complex topic, I believe. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Ravi Chandra Singh, who has done so much of research on this and actually has come out with a book so he's going to give us a lot uh, you know very good analysis so we look forward to one hour of very intriguing uh, sort of discussion on the topic i'll just i'll make two comments before i uh, leave the screen uh, to mr singh dr singh is that you know if you look at the growth uh, pattern in the northeast actually all the states uh, were languishing to some extent uh, for about 50 years after independence. But things started changing in the 1990s, you know, when central government also uh, started a more proactive role in this area and came up with a lot of investment opportunities in the uh, public sector investment opportunities there, you know. And basically, uh, the whole idea was to, you know, sort of help this region to overcome its backlogs in uh, connectivity and uh, basic infrastructure and so on and so forth. And that actually propelled the growth rate. I mean, basically all the states in the in this uh, present, uh, you know, twenty first century, all the states in the region actually shifted to a higher growth trajectory. So growth actually has been propelled. I mean, basically lifted, uh, but not so much by things like corporate investments, big corporate investments, or by FDI inflow and all that. It was mostly driven by, uh, you know. Um, 
public expenditure for infrastructure and all that. And at the ground level, of course, this uh, uh, improved connectivity as a result of this public expenditure and you know market connectivity, etc., uh, created condition for uh, you know micro level entrepreneurs to come up. So there is a flourishing of activities in agriculture and other things, and many micro level. I mean, data may not reveal it all the time because data collection agencies uh, in this region may be having some deficiencies, but but that's in the that's what is happening in the ground level, you know. So uh, we have a particular kind of growth which is uh, propelled by you can say yes, government uh, public sector investment and also sort of you know followed up by local small level entrepreneurial growth, which of course can in the next generation can expand. Now talking of employment, so he, Dr. Singh is going to link these two things. You know, we know the labor markets everywhere are actually notorious for their imperfections. Uh, in the Northeast, actually, it is slightly more, and also the fragmentation is pretty, pretty high. So uh, how Dr. Singh is going to relate growth and employment within the region or within the states of the region, uh, I'm very keenly waiting to listen from him. So uh, instead of, you know, wasting uh, time in my general knowledge rather than uh, my specialized knowledge on this particular subject. Let us go over to Dr. Ravi Chandra Singh for hearing a professional analysis of the linkages between employment and growth in Northeast India. Over to Dr. Singh. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so first of all, uh, actually, I would like to uh, thank uh, the EGO Foundation uh, and especially to Professor Charan Singh, sir, for giving me this opportunity to put some of my views uh, rather in summary wise uh, for form of my book. And uh, also, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Vesbarosa for uh, chairing this session. It's an honor for uh, uh, for me to, uh, it's a privilege actually for me to have uh, this session chaired by Professor Vesbaro as uh, he is also, uh, he is uh, a well-known professor in contributing uh, about uh, the aspects of the Northeast region. Um, so, and also I would like to thank the audience for being here. So coming to the uh, topic, as uh, uh, Professor ha has mentioned, Bez Professor Bezbarasa has mentioned that it is uh, rather complex and it is indeed, it is a complex uh, situation where they, uh, to link between the employment and economic growth. And uh, in this uh, short span of time, I would uh, like to, uh, and I have had a very uh, big challenges to summarize these uh, things into much more uh, uh, simplified ways uh, as much as possible. So. I hope that uh, I will be able to do justice on this uh, front. So uh, to start with, uh, I actually want to share the slide and uh, we'll go forward with that. So I hope that everyone, uh, this slide is uh, visible. So here it is. Uh, my name is Vinay Chandra Singh, once again. Uh, so here, uh, the study uh, starts with, as, say, as said, uh, that the northeastern region uh, actually um, before uh, it became a part of this uh, uh, region of the Indian uh, territory uh, before the independence, uh, the northeastern region had long tradition of uh, the you know, flourishing its economy uh, trade with the eastern Himalayas and sub regions like uh, uh, Tibet and uh, uh, China and uh, other uh, areas of the Southeast Asian nations. However, uh, the thing is that after uh, the after the um, uh, independence of uh, India, uh, then there has been a lot of uh, restrictions uh, coming in uh, to the uh, region. And so uh, the, the region suddenly became a landlocked region, uh, restricting all of its possible straits, uh, trade which were available uh, pre-independence uh, era. So, um, the, uh, so because of the geographical constraints, uh, topographical uh, transformations, uh, uh, they started leading to uh, uh, you know lack of physical infrastructure which is actually uh, limiting the growth and development of the northeast region and also this created a further backwardness and uh, deprivation uh, and alienation to the uh, rest of the country and as well as the rest of the world so uh, uh, what happened was that uh, even the private investors and the, the mncs uh, were not ready to uh, invest in these areas and uh, uh, the public uh, the government was the only uh, was taking initiatives to, uh, to to fulfill the development of this um, uh, states, northeastern region. So 
Here, uh, I have just put in the, the uh, at this policy. I uh, just want to brief about that, that uh, uh, it is updated version of the Lucas policy as uh, many of us would be knowing. And uh, uh, ACOS, ACOS, uh policy actually, uh, uh, actually it, it uh, became something of, uh, it, it, it became a, a rather, uh, you know, uh, the end of the discussion type of, uh, uh, you know, that whether uh, the, the uh, main, mainstream uh, policies of uh, the of the overall Indian policies were actually uh, affecting uh, positively uh, towards the goal of uh, achieving pro uh, development to the northeast region. So, ACTIS uh, policy uh, is a uh, focus is is actually uh, what you call uh, it is uh, centric. Uh, its its focus is uh, or centered uh, towards the development of northeast region and. Uh, so uh, here, uh, from that itself, we can understand that uh, yeah, Northeastern region has been lagging behind when we uh, try to mainstream, uh, you know, the, the different uh, general policies that is available. Uh, so uh, scenario, so I'm going to uh, actually look at the scenario of uh, the growth and employment in the Northeast region during uh, the reforms. Uh, then, uh, and when I'm looking at why I have uh, uh, included or why I have put a chain of uh, linked between the employment and the uh, uh, poverty, uh, sorry, the economic growth is because, uh, as we know that uh, the inclusive growth, uh, the idea of inclusive growth itself, uh, you know, it's it's about growth and the the uh, the pro poor, uh, you know, uh, 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 pro poor policies, which is uh, the property reduction. So we have the uh, basically the nexus uh, which is being linked by the employment of the nexus between the growth and the poverty reduction, which is being linked by the employment. And that's why I wanted to uh, highlight this on this issue. So uh, before I start with the objectives uh, or uh, rather the key aspects of what my discussion is all about, I just wanted to highlight uh, in brief about the, the socioeconomic indicators which uh, the data available uh, in, uh, in, in terms of uh, the Northeastern region specifically. So if, you, if we look at it uh, in, in terms of literacy rate, um, uh, uh, some uh, some of the states have been doing uh, uh, pretty well uh, above the all India average, uh, but uh, in terms of the infant mortality rate, uh, Assam, uh, the Meghalaya are uh, higher than uh, than the uh, all India, which is again uh, just a summary of it. And then poverty ratio, uh, Manipur is uh, having a much higher um, uh, in, in terms of the uh, poverty ratio in, 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 uh, compared to the all India region. Then per capita NSDP, uh, NSDP in this case, uh, Sikkim, uh, then Mizoram and Arunachal Pradesh, basically they, uh, they have above the average. Other than that, uh, all others are uh, on the lower side. Okay, so and if we look at the per capita uh, availability of uh, power also, if you uh, look at this uh, data, then uh, the average uh, uh, on the national average is much higher than the, what is available for the Northeast region. This can also have uh, some kind of uh, uh, reference to the infrastructure which is available. Uh, okay, then uh, regarding the uh, the human development index of the uh, northeastern region, uh, in this case, uh, Mizoram uh, supposed to be uh, one of the uh, best in terms of literacy rate. Um, they uh, are uh, pretty close, but uh, they are not as uh, uh, high uh, on the uh, national average standard. Uh, if you look at it, all the rest of the states, they uh, are actually the score of the HDI are pretty low. If you look at it uh, from this, uh, this report is actually uh, taken from the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. And why I have taken this report? Because uh, they uh, did the report analysis of each different states uh, separately uh, serving. Uh, it's not uh, like the other uh, research where uh, they have done uh, um, a proxy, taken the proxy of Assam and done for the other states. So that's why I have taken this, uh, this data. Then in terms of sustainable development goals, uh, here composite index, uh, we have uh, Manipur and the Sikkim. Uh, they are on par with the All India level composite index. Uh, other than that, all of them are uh, below the national average. Uh, in terms of the poverty in the region, uh, as I, I also uh, highlighted earlier that Manipur, uh, in the 2011-12 uh, uh, report, which is the latest available for now, uh, based on the Tendulkar methodology, uh, here again uh, uh, it is the highest. And other than that, uh, other other states are also in, in uh, above the average. Most of the states. 
And then state finances, again, uh, most of the states uh, fund is actually, or let's say the finances of the states are uh, major, majorly dependent upon the uh, fund funding from the center. And so we can see it from the data also itself uh, that uh, even though having despite of its natural resources, which is available, um, uh, they are not uh, yet uh, able to mobilize those and uh, uh, make it into something uh, productive uh, as much uh, to, to make them self-sufficient. Uh, so uh, uh, the the tax revenue collection is also lower, of course, because of the commercial activity, low levels of commercial activity and low levels of consumption as such. So uh, my uh, 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 the book discussion uh, revolves around these uh, four uh, aspects. Uh, so uh, the first one is the uh, we will be talking about the uh, development experience of the northeast region uh, post reform period, uh, then the uh, employment and unemployment scenario. Uh, uh, yeah, of, of the uh, uh, in the post reform period of this uh, region, and then the major sources of growth in per capita uh, in the region, and also the uh, sectorial and the aggregate productivity of labor evolved after the post reform period. So, uh, these uh, four aspects I will be uh, uh, dwelling upon, and uh, the data sources that I have taken are uh, these are the data sources uh, here, as you can see here. The major findings, uh, which I will be uh, again uh, discussing more on this major findings. Uh, the the in briefly, uh, I'll be talking about the growth rate and the structural transformation for these northeastern region, the employment scenario of the northeastern region, and the economic growth and employment linkages. So, uh, coming to uh, the first uh, finding, major finding. So this one is the that uh, the diverse there is actually uh, a diverse growth rate region across the states, and uh, the thing is that uh, uh, when I was uh, collecting uh, this data for for a post reform period, um, that uh, found that uh, uh, there was no clear cut answer for structural reforms uh, effectiveness of uh, structural reforms. Uh, uh, in, uh, in in terms of acceleration of the growth rates, uh, both in terms of aggregate and sectoral levels. Uh, then uh, there were many uh, also there were many breakpoints also uh, where uh, the the uh, preceding the reforms and as well as uh, after the reforms uh, but after uh, many lagged years so again uh, there was no uh, concluding evidence to show uh, in my uh, area of work that uh, that uh, the that post reform uh, policies actually had a major impact uh, in in uh, the majority of the states. Then uh, we uh, dive, uh, dive down to this uh, structural uh, changes. So uh, in terms of the uh, structural changes, uh, uh, we have uh, in all the states, which is uh, uh, shifting from the agriculture to service sector. As you can see that the GSDP contribution of all the states has been shifting from agriculture. And this is normal uh, in most cases, uh, except for uh, Sikkim. So Sikkim, uh, the largest contributor is coming from the industry. Uh, the share of industry also uh, rose, uh, except for natural produce in this case. Um, uh, then Nagaland had no major significant transformation, structural transformation as per the record which was available. Uh, uh, so uh, despite the fall in contribution, again, uh, the share of the employment declined relatively slowly uh, in all the uh, states. Then coming to the structural employment, uh, we when we look at the uh, structural employment here, uh, the uh, uh, service sector workforce uh, were constituting the highest, uh, larger majority of it for the states of Manipur, Nagaland, and Tripura. Uh, and uh, uh, for, uh, for, for the rest of the states, it was uh, the agriculture sector constituting the largest source of employment. Uh, and when we uh, look into this comparative share of output uh, uh, and worker, uh, the, the output was lower than the workers throughout. Uh, for, for the other states, the share of the output was greater uh, greater uh, than the share of the employment except money for so in case of uh, the tripura also uh, same thing that, that the share of the output and employment in those sectors raised a close close movement in that case so this was uh, something uh, this was for the structural employment uh, regarding the employment scenario here uh, when we uh, look at the employment scenario uh, based on the uh, statistics uh, data we compiled from 1993 uh, to up to, to 2017-18, uh, 
uh, the compilation of both the NSSO uh, data and also, also uh, the PLFS data. Uh, in the 2017-18, uh, this was the case that Sikkim, Meghalaya, and Tripura had to have lesser unemployment rate uh, than the national average. So somewhat uh, in this case, uh, Sikkim, Meghalaya, and Tripura did fairly, but uh, uh, the rest of the states uh, were very uh, uh, were facing a lot of problem in in terms of different segmentation of unemployment, which I'm going to also present uh, with the help of figures uh, here also. Uh, Nagaland uh, tops the list of highest unemployment for all uh, of for all categories of uh, uh, the unemployment segments that uh, will be unfolding also. Um, then uh, Meghalaya and Sikkim had the lowest unemployment rates, uh, so uh, 1.5 and 3.5 percent respectively. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the the latest uh, PLFS data, and uh, all the states were also found to be experiencing uh, some kind of uh, growing uh, educated unemployment rates. Uh, so, one thing uh, I would like to also address is that uh, uh, the the uh, unemployment, educated unemployment, uh, which I have not uh, put in uh, in this book, uh, but in my thesis uh, uh, about the primary analysis uh, on that front of Manipur is also uh, very very high, uh, which uh, I, I will be not be discussing more on this. Uh, this is uh, the uh, the aspects where uh, this will be limited to only these few uh, uh, major highlights of the states. The, the highest educated unemployment happened in Nagaland and the state of Meghalaya, the lowest. So uh, the highest rise in educated unemployment also happened in Manipur, in rural and Sikkim. So I'll just uh, try to showcase the uh, data here, uh, the figures here. So by looking at this, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, graph uh, chart here in, in that rural unemployment rate and the urban unemployment rate, if we look at it, uh, the Meghalaya, Mizoram and Sikkim, these are the few uh, states which have uh, done uh, comparatively better uh, if we uh, look on the average uh, on the national average side, uh, whereas the other states has uh, had a very high unemployment, rural unemployment rate, as we can see from the chart. And especially in 2017-18, if we focus on that, then uh, Nagaland is pretty high compared to uh, the All India. And then uh, urban employment rate also again here, uh, Meghalaya and Sikkim, uh, they were uh, the ones which were a better, lower unemployment rate or if you compare the other states, but the other states had a very high uh, and, and you can see the Nagaland has uh, this case also. Then in, uh, in terms of the uh, unemployment rate of uh, rural educated and uh, unemployment rate of urban educated, so we see here that uh, the uh, Nagaland actually is, has the highest. However, uh, if we look at the growth rate of the uh, unemployment uh, rate of the rural educated, uh, then Manipur is uh, supposed to be the highest. Uh, then, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of the urban side, uh, then we look at Sikkim. Actually, Nagaland is already the highest, but uh, Sikkim. Uh, if we look at Sikkim, then it has the uh, highest uh, growth uh, rate. One of the highest. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, from the past 2011-12 data. So again, here also, uh, uh, it is surprising because uh, Sikkim uh, is one of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the state which is performing uh, good in terms of employment uh, in overall, but uh, in terms of the uh, educated uh, uh, urban uh, unemployment rate, uh, it, is, uh, it seems to be growing. Uh, which is, uh, but uh, lower than the national average, but, uh, but you can see uh, the effect here which is changing. Then uh, coming to the uh, rural youth unemployment rate and the urban youth unemployment rate, again here, uh, Nagaland seems to be having a quite large uh, rural youth unemployment rate followed by Manipur and then Assam uh, and Arunachal Pradesh also. So uh, again, in terms of the urban youth unemployment also, we can see here that the uh, Mizoram, Nagaland and the uh, uh, Mizoram, Nagaland, uh, is uh, they they are actually uh, very pretty high in that case also. So if you uh, look again in, in the case of Mizoram uh, overall, they are pretty good. But uh, if you segment it a little more further down, and if you look at the uh, uh, the, the urban youth unemployment rate, then uh, Mizoram also has a very high and also is growing at a very fast rate. Then. Uh, Coming to the uh, the economic growth and the uh, the, the employment uh, in this uh, economic growth and employment. So here, uh, I would just like to uh, you know explain a little further on this uh, that why I've taken uh, the two approaches 
uh, why I have taken only these uh, two approaches. So, so uh, here uh, in this case, the uh, the uh, the uh, okay. So uh, uh, the thing is that uh, uh, the economic growth and employment here, uh, when we uh, look at it. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, the the uh, the growth has been the timeline that I have taken is uh, post reform period, uh, the uh, till the 2018-19, and uh, uh, they were uh, sort of the uh, uh, diverse uh, growth regimes. Okay, uh, which uh, which will be focusing more on that here. So employment elasticity approach and the uh, job. Uh, so there are two approaches which I have taken to analyze this economic growth and employment. So the first one is the employment elasticity approach, which is a traditional approach, which is there. And the other one is the, the uh, job generation and the growth decomposition tool, uh, which is also known as the shapeless decomposition analysis approach. And uh, this is actually widely used in the, uh, the, uh, the World Bank uh, data of analyzing uh, the, uh, uh, the bifurcation of uh, economic growth and employment linkages. So uh, coming to uh, that, uh, first, uh, the employment elasticity is here. If we uh, drill down a little on that elasticity with respect to the sectoral income, uh, it was found to be highly erratic uh, and between positive and negative values. So if you uh, just look at this, uh, the states of Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya and Nagaland, uh, they exhibited positive elasticities on, in all sectors in the first region, uh, that is, up till 1993 to 1990, 2000. But uh, in the timeline of uh, 2011 and 12, uh, no state had positive elasticities, uh, indicating that growth in the income actually reversed the employment growth. So, uh, so the thing is that uh, uh, as the economy was growing, uh, as the economy was growing, uh, the, there was a, a reverse employment generation, uh, which was seen in a majority of the states here. Okay. Um, interestingly, uh, in service sector, if you just look at the service sector uh, for uh, four states, namely Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Mizoram, and Sikkim, uh, they exhibited positive elasticities throughout, which means to say that uh, uh, that uh, the, the, as the income uh, economic uh, growth was taking place, uh, employment generation was also taking place in service sector in these uh, four states. Uh, okay, but in the major, if you look at the major. Uh, uh, the, uh, the aggregate uh, sectors uh, then uh, uh, they were uh, uh, kind of uh, all erratic and in, in, in some cases, in most of the cases actually, that uh, uh, economic growth uh, was actually not creating uh, employment generation. So uh, decomposition of economic growth here in uh, when we are uh, decomposing the uh, economic growth here. So uh, I would like to uh, just, uh, uh, you know, segregate this into three portions. Uh, one is the uh, uh, growth, which is linked to the output per worker, uh, working population and employment. Uh, then uh, the employment linked to sectors and also productive linked to sectors. I'll just dwell upon this uh, slowly. So uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the growth, which is linked to the output per worker and working population and employment, uh, we can see that each state uh, were mostly contributed by the growth in output per worker. Uh, that is the productivity. Uh, so productivity was uh, the leading uh, uh, contributor in terms of the growth for uh, uh, the, the states. Uh, and uh, the impeding factor, which is the restricting factor, which was uh, 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 the, the, uh, the, the population, uh, the working population growth was the, uh, the impeding factor, which also implies that uh, um, the mismatch of uh, skills, um, mismatch of the, the skills and the job uh, availability, that is also kind of reflects with this data that, uh, that this has become the uh, impeding factor. Then if we uh, look at the uh, employment links uh, linked to uh, the, the sectors, then there has been a decline of employment overall, uh, which was uh, again, uh, mostly contributed by the uh, agriculture sector, which was visible in majority of the states here. If you, uh, if you look at it, then uh, the, 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 the decline of the employment was uh, majorly uh, contributed by the agriculture sector. But then, then in case of Tripura, it was a decline in the workforce in the industrial sector, which, is, which was impeding the employment growth uh, in terms of the decomposition of employment growth in this case. So this is the uh, highlight of the uh, employment linked to sectors. Then uh, regarding the productivity linked to sectors, 
So in this one, the uh, industrial sector uh, contributed to the highest uh, for the majority of the states uh, in terms of total output per worker. So, uh, but then except for Manipur and Meghalaya, uh, the contributing factor was coming in from the service sector. If we uh, decompose uh, the productive, uh, productivity growth, uh, then uh, we have this result that, uh, that the service sector was actually uh, 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 more into towards the uh, service sector was actually contributing to the, uh, 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 the contributing factor of the Manipur and Meghalaya state. Then uh, revolving around the major uh, aspects, the four aspects uh, that uh, uh, revolving around the four aspects uh, that uh, I was uh, uh, talking about earlier. So these were some of the, the results, uh, some of the findings that we can summarize it in terms that is uh, the economic growth has uh, not been growing remarkably throughout uh, in this uh, uh, region. Uh, socioeconomic ind indicators are also quite low. Uh, majority of the states are not financially uh, independent, uh, and we can see that. Then uh, the job-oriented policies uh, have not yet impacted the employment. As uh, I, I forgot to, I missed out uh, some point. That is that, uh, like uh, they, uh, in the in the year 2014, uh, 15, uh, 14, 15 onwards, uh, there has been a lot of uh, schemes, a lot of uh, Skill India program, uh, Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana, and so many uh, youth-oriented and uh, job-oriented basically uh, schemes uh, were initiated. Uh, However, uh, that is uh, not yet been uh, reflected in terms of the employment as uh, we could see from the uh, employment uh, results uh, in this uh, uh, the larger portion of the Northeast region states. Then large number of educated unemployment and youth unemployment are also something to be uh, looked upon. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, policies framework has to be uh, uh, put in, in these uh, segment also. Then the productivity of the, the workers uh, also have been contributing to the greater share of output, uh, which also means increasing skills, technology, and intersectoral shifts. That means that uh, uh, one of the major contributing factor to some growth in, in, in the region has been uh, the increase in productivity and, and not the increase in employment growth. Uh, that could mean that, that have an implication of the increase in skills and technology and intersectoral shifts. Then, uh, uh, on the other hand, the impeding factor, uh, the limiting the growth of the uh, 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 of the of the region, uh, where uh, number of working uh, population on the rise, showing to uh, showing the mismatch of skills and labor availability. So this was also uh, there in this uh, case. Then, uh, 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 regarding the uh, the sectorial and aggregate productivity of labor, uh, in this case. Uh, post-reform period, we have the, the, the industrial sector uh, tend to be the contributing the highest for majority of the states uh, and, and uh, for, for except for Manipur and Meghalaya, where the uh, productivity increase is uh, coming from the service sector. So these are some of the references uh, that I have taken and uh, uh, that's all, but uh, I would be uh, uh, I would be uh, uh, happy to uh, answer some of the things. I have uh, quite summarized it, uh, thinking that uh, the session uh, was uh, almost for uh, just 30 minutes. So I had to summarize in that format. But uh, for clarity uh, in any of this uh, point, uh, I'm happy to uh, answer the questions. So uh, thank you. Uh, over to uh, Professor Besbarasa. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Singh. Uh, you had made a presentation of, uh, you know, facts and some analysis of those available data and uh, regarding the growth uh, and sectoral growth and uh, employment and sectoral employment and looking at the correspondences and all that. And uh, basic conclusions are that, you know, that some of the uh, efforts made by the government in the form of skill formation, etc., has not had much impact on the Northeast. Uh, okay, I'll not like to make my comments. Let it be a discussion. So people, whoever uh, wants to uh, give a comment or ask a question, kindly unmute yourself and go ahead. Yes, sir. 
I think uh, stop sorry. sharing it. Yes, sorry. Uh, I think John Singh so has a question. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, I really like your presentation, very tight and very brief. That's uh, very well done. Uh, I had a question. You know, there is now, as I look at it, Northeast as an engine of growth uh, for the rest of the world. And to me, it is a virgin land. And this can lead the country into a different orbit now. Now, having done your research so extensively, you've looked at industry, you've looked at services. I had a question for you from for three different questions, and you're welcome to handle them the way you want. What do you think is the potential of organic agriculture, which is uh, the modern, um, um, I think, the very uh, with lots of potential uh, in the modern world. So, what is the potential of Northeast, keeping in mind the organic agriculture? The second question is, there is so much of the food processing potential in Northeast, which is again related to agriculture, but probably processed agriculture like jams and pineapple and you know, pineapple and uh, fruits, which are so much there in production and not properly, probably being used. That is the second one. And the third is, in case India needs to open up to foreign companies, which are 9 lakh of them operating in China, foreign companies, if we need to open up those foreign companies, what do you think is the potential of Northeast in welcoming and providing support uh, to the government's policy of um, supporting the uh, foreign companies in terms of would you need more export processing zones or would you need uh, more, uh, more infrastructure? to attract and retain the foreign companies? I mean, what is your analysis on that as a potential for India to go for? Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, first, I would like to answer that organic ag agriculture. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the organic agriculture has uh, been widely uh, started in Sikkim, but uh, there are a lot of discussion on that, that uh, uh, the 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 actually the uh, organic uh, the the uh, agriculture policies that is being implemented there actually are actually uh, limiting or rather affecting the uh, consumption uh, of the the, uh, the people out there difficulties in uh, because the organic uh, products the organic uh, 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 productions are actually uh, pretty uh, in terms expensive uh, if you look at it uh, the prices and the uh, the productions uh, the, they are costly and uh, to finance that that is again difficult and uh, the problem is that uh, still uh, the northeastern states uh, even though uh, p many people now have come to know about its uh, 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 you know uh, its uh, closeness to the nature and uh, the cleanliness and uh, those things uh, even now also the the market uh, uh, for the northeast uh, products uh, are not uh, have not uh, reached its potential. Uh, so, starting a, a organic uh, uh, products uh, or organic culture uh, at this point uh, is a, still a big challenge because uh, there is a, a low market uh, right now. But uh, we are trying uh, to, uh, for example, if you if we uh, look at the uh, black rice uh, cultivation, uh, uh, black rice cultivation is actually uh, uh, now people have come to know that uh, this black rice is good for health and everything and uh, the thing is that uh, uh, even though we have a good potential in uh, a place like Manipur to grow uh, those uh, black rice, uh, but then already in places in Uttar Pradesh and everywhere they have already started uh, uh, putting this. So it is very difficult to uh, understand which one is more organic or which one is not organic uh, based upon the market. So it's still having a big challenge that we have to sort this out that if we just trying to implement organic agriculture in this part of the uh, region uh, will it uh, will it help them or or, or it will uh, or or will it have a, a you know a, 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 a negative impact on the people who are uh, doing the business out there so that is one thing i could uh, put on that and uh, regarding the food processing 
yes of course uh, uh, there has been a series of food processing and a lot of entrepreneurs have already uh, started uh, uh, processing foods but uh, 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 for example the the pineapples and uh, the other uh, sources of pickle and so and so but the thing is that uh, the transportation is the limitation here uh, the infrastructure of transportation is still uh, uh, not uh, up to the mark to to have a cost effective uh, 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 this a uh, process in the production. So this is one thing which again is a big challenge. Once this uh, infrastructure uh, barrier is, uh, I think, uh, uh, is is solved, uh, then I think uh, food processing business is also one uh, way we, where we can uh, go ahead with. And in terms of the foreign companies, uh, if we uh, look at uh, the uh, the region of the Northeast region, it is mostly the region is uh, exposed to the foreign uh, regions and. Uh, uh, so, uh, so having the access policy uh, itself is actually a very big opportunity for them to uh, grow. So, yes, uh, if uh, there is uh, these, if if there is this uh, relaxation and if this there is more emphasis or regarding the policies, uh, which uh, makes it more uh, uh, business friendly uh, towards the uh, uh, towards the the international companies, I think uh, that would uh, help uh, the uh, northeast region to. Uh, fulfill uh, the potential of their uh, uh, growth with the help of foreign companies also. So that is the, what I can put in, 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 in short. Sir. Okay, thank you again. Uh, are there any more queries or something? Yes, uh, uh, can I join? Yeah, please, please, please. Uh, I am uh, Matthew Green, a professor in Mahatma Gandhi University, Kerala. Uh, yes. At the outset, I, I want to congratulate Dr. Tebichandra for a very realistic presentation of the topic. I have two queries uh, related to the question raised by uh, Char Professor Charan Singh. One is on the scope of plantations agriculture uh, in Northeast. What, what, what may be the, for example, we know that in Tripura, uh, rubber plantations uh, found very successful. So what may be the extension of such plantations uh, in other parts of uh, Northeast? That is one of my questions. Uh, and again, I think one, uh, one added scope I find in carbon sequestration. So if, if, if we can tap internationally this great facility, that may be a uh, that that may be an advantage not only to the northeast but for the entire India. Uh, then the second question again related to that. That is now we are very the whole world is very much worried about uh, the loss of biodiversity, and uh, I think uh, northeast is relatively rich in biodiversity. So uh, how far the conser conver uh, con conservation? of di uh, biodiversity is going ahead uh, because this is a very vulnerable period on biodiversity. So government intervention is absolutely necessary for conservation. So these are my two queries, again, related to the organic question raised by Professor Charan Singh. Thank you very much. Again, I congratulate you. Thank you for asking this question. Uh, it's, it's now Mr. Singh's, Dr. Singh's turn to answer. Yes. Uh, so, uh, regarding the plantation of agriculture, uh, uh, regarding this uh, issue, uh, where uh, about the successful about, uh, of the rubber plant plantation, uh, as I mentioned about the uh, the, the uh, issue of the uh, uh, black rice cultivation in, in Manipur, uh, even though uh, we uh, see the potential of it, uh, uh, the farmers are uh, not yet ready to uh, opt for this, and actually it needs a lot of uh, intensive uh, 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 cultivation, which is uh, not easy for these uh, uh, farmers to adopt to. So there has to be, I think, some sort of uh, uh, policies uh, uh, which uh, can help uh, in terms of uh, subsidies or in terms of awareness uh, uh, to for each region uh, to help them grow. I think in uh, in uh, in places in Manipur also uh, there has been. Uh, 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 this thing, a promotion of uh, like uh, orange plantation also, uh, 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 and orange festivals happens every year. Uh, but the thing is that 
uh, after the orange festivals happens the the uh, there is a large uh, major amount of uh, orange goes to waste because uh, again uh, the transportation uh, issues are there so even if uh, we know that, that there is a large potential for uh, orange plantation in that area uh, there is no market uh, uh, which is uh, which can be uh, uh, available for that because of the lack of infrastructure so uh, so it so it depends on, on the each uh, different uh, northeastern states uh, how uh, how are their cultivations uh, feasible and uh, i think more more than that i think it, it is the uh, policies and awareness uh, that has to be given to the uh, farmers and the people who are responsible for uh, these kind of plantations to uh, to uh, to make it successful i think the policies are important and and uh, uh, regarding i think the uh, the second second question which is uh, i'm not sure uh, that i could uh, uh, figure out uh, the the second question but uh, it's uh, is it related something on the urban uh, segment of the uh, uh, region uh, can you uh, just no, I mean, leave it to leave it to me i'll try to handle it yes 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 yeah, do you have any more queries or can i sum up Yes, sir. Uh, just two more questions. Yeah. I, I would like to ask you one question. I'm Professor Nupendana and Sonar of Kiki State Open University. So, in your data set, you have stated that the Sikkim has a maximum contribution from the industrial sector to the gross uh, this state domestic product. At the same time, in terms of sustainability, also Sikkim has shown this thing. Is there a relationship between the two? Could you attribute it or just, just it came on its own? Contribution to the manufacturing sector, contribution of the manufacturing sector to the uh, state domestic product and the sustainability front. And another thing is that in your data set, did you say, try to see the uh, disparities uh, or the similarities in terms of the rural urban phenomena? State wise, we have seen it, rural urban. These are the two aspects which I'd like to have some clarifications. Okay. Would you like to have so, all the remaining questions together and answer them? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. that is also fine. Yeah, please, uh, others who wanted to raise the issue. Sir, I think just go. Uh, yes, sir. This is Abhishek. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, sir. Right, sir. Firstly, thank you very much for the informative presentation, sir. Just two, three questions which came to my mind, sir, on this context. Uh, if you could just throw light on uh, them. One is, sir, uh, when we talk about uh, the economy of Northeast, uh, and we know that a lot of it is informal trade with, especially with Myanmar and which has, which we have such a large border. I mean, what is actually the way forward uh, to, you know, uh, formalize that informal economy, let me put it that way, uh, so that it's a win-win for all and uh, what really should be the way forward for that? That would be one, sir. Second is, I mean, uh, at a national level, I mean, uh, India has this preferred nation status to Bangladesh and a lot of trade happens probably between India and Bangladesh, but seems to be more at the cost of any other region. So if anything can be done probably to balance that, uh, you know, asymmetricity. And uh, third is, I mean, is there any way uh, or some successful models how uh, the uh, community owned lands of Northeast can be, you know, really put to use for more economic purpose? Uh, I'll just stop there, sir. Thank you. Okay. I think we are more or less done with the questions. Yeah, your answers. And yes. Finally, I will put my comments. Yes. So, uh, regarding this, uh, I would just first uh, uh, would like to answer this that uh, regarding the the informal activities, uh, which is closely happening. If you if you look at uh, the uh, Myanmar and the uh, the Indian border, which is uh, uh, close to the Manipur, uh, that uh, Burma and Manipur border. Uh, there has been already uh, a lot of informal uh, trade that had been happening uh, uh, since the inception of it, and uh, there has been there. Uh, but the thing is that uh, uh, the uh, uh, because of these uh, restrictions, uh, there are other potential uh, 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 trades or uh, related to agriculture and allied activities which uh, are being restricted. Like for example, if you if we look at uh, the uh, fish uh, in terms of fish. Uh, the, the fish availability uh, in in the these areas of the uh, border sector they could have easily uh, get a better uh, source of fish uh, from those uh, areas but because of the restrictions uh, and policies uh, followed uh, 
uh, they are getting uh, lesser quality products of the fishing and so uh, the prices of the fish uh, if we look at in in uh, if we look at uh, which is all uh, farming in 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 the, in the in those states are pretty high uh, comparatively and uh, that those things are there so what my uh, understanding is that the uh, if uh, the if uh, uh, the the if there is an, a proper opening uh, of these northeastern region uh, and uh, it was the uh, myanmar region uh, uh, in terms of uh, 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 focused policies uh, which uh, you know there, there could be a, a more a tax revenue collection also uh, that could also help in uh, growing the economy as such because uh, because of the informal lot of trades that has been happening uh, again the government is not able to uh, uh, reap the benefit of the uh, uh, reap the benefit of uh, this thing and the reason that they mostly state is uh, uh, regarding the security issues and such um, so this this I would like to summarize on that front and uh, uh, regarding the regarding the Sikkim uh, Sikkim uh, uh, that uh, sir has uh, mentioned about that why uh, on the on, on the front of the uh, the, the uh, why the, there is this industrial growth that is uh, more uh, 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 this thing uh, in in the uh, in the Sikkim uh, it is uh, basically in Sikkim uh, uh, from the uh, the past records that we have. Uh, uh, the starting from the 1990s records of the uh, GSDP contribution, uh, it already had uh, uh, this, uh, 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 the industries which were actually uh, leading uh, in terms of the GSDP contribution uh, for the states and uh, also for the uh, service sector also because of the uh, tourism uh, that they have uh, in, in that particular uh, state. Uh, so uh, I think that's that's uh, how that much I think I can uh, tell from my. Uh, Observation for uh, the, uh, the the Sikkim point of view also. One thing I would like to ask. Yeah, go ahead. Sir, I am Sambuddha. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, sir. Sir, I am Sambuddha Mukherjee. I am doing my MSc in Agricultural Economics in Sam Higginbottom Institute of Agriculture and Technology, Prayagraj, Chittagong Pradesh. Sir, I would yes. like to ask one question that. Uh, we know that Northeast India is very rich in natural resources and forest, forest products also. So in this situation, if the government wants to produce, produce industry or establish industrial matters, then it is very important that land should be taken. And in these cases, we can see two factors. Firstly, firstly the land of tribals cannot be uh, purchased by the non-tribals as per the normal constitutional laws, which is very important hazard in these cases because there is a matter in land reorganization. And the second matter is, is it compromisable to uh, per, uh, to deforest or cut the natural products or the for deforestation for industrial production? Or is it so, judicious okay. to do? Because this thing has happens in Gujarat that when we can see uh, there is almost every type of compromisation has occurred with the nature for the industrial development, industrial progress. That is why Gujarat is so much developed in industrially. So is this possible in this perspective in Northeastern states? So in in terms of uh, the uh, laws and the, uh, the the things which have you are mentioning, uh, I think I'm not an expert on that to uh, answer this uh, information. Okay then, uh, can I uh, take five minutes in summarizing it? Uh, all right. <clears throat> See, if you're working in northeast, uh, I mean everywhere in India, this problem is there. The data is, I don't know what extent this is reliable. That is uh, one issue. But in Northeast, if you're working, uh, there are uh, serious problems because uh, you see, till the, till the other day, actually, for instance, uh, NSDP data, you know, basically uh, state income data and in constant prices, were not even available for states like Mizoram and Nagaland. So it's very recent that even the government sectors have got their uh, data sort of, you know, uh, in a standardized kind of format. And secondly, we rely on things like NSSO data and all that. And if you go to the northeastern states, the sample sizes are so small, you know, so sometimes the credibility of these data becomes a little uh, problematic. So what uh, Dr. Singh has been doing mostly is the secondary data. I have seen uh, the hazard in that uh, while my students have been working on that. Uh, so uh, the work you have done is uh, quite commendable, but I think if you try to in your next project or, you know, uh, follow up of this work, if you try to find out the stories behind this, the anecdotal evidence going to the field and trying to understand the nuances, you know, the kind of questions and feedbacks you have received, you know, 
if you i think you will get another story you know there can be a sequel to what you have written there can be a, a second volume to that particular uh, thing so i think this is something i will request you to please take up you are a young man i believe relatively i'm on the verge of retirement <laughs> <laughs> if you say why yourself you don't do it <laughs> that's my answer my energy is you know more or less uh, gone uh regarding uh yeah that is what i have said and uh dr charan singh has raised something extremely very in interesting issues and these some some partial answers i can give you know so organic agriculture for instance in obviously in the northeast there is scope for organic agriculture because many parts actually they haven't seen a blade of you know uh, a, a little bit of even a little bit of fertilizer and all that particularly see in interior or natural produce and there are many areas interior places where chemicals have not been totally used but organizing these uh, these parts i mean obviously after sri lanka and all we should know that wholesome going you know 100% for organic is going to be suicidal for instance, in Assam, it's, it's simply not possible in the plains. Rice production will fall, people will be hungry, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the horticulture sector in certain parts, I think it's there is scope for uh, going uh, organic. But the problem is that, you know, sir, and everyone, all of us, we know that if you have to go organic, the costs are going to be higher. And obviously, you must be the farmers must be able to receive the remunerative prices for which certification export etc etc are very very important the so small farmers may be organized by you know farmer producers companies and all that but there has to be a big corporate aggregator who can give this a level who can who can get the certification and who can do the marketing so that this i think is a, one of the missing links and connectivity is of course is an issue because connectivity has improved tremendously in last 20 years still Getting certain things from very interior, say, or natural produce to even the main cities, then to the you know processing plants, it's going to take some time. So I believe sometime something is going to happen, and price realization is uh, going to be extremely important. Food uh, processing you have raised, uh, I think it's happening to some extent, but the same thing, you know, kind of you know aggregation and processing and some corporate involvement at a higher level, at the aggregated level, will be extremely important. But something I'd like to share. Uh, we see that now many horticulture products are actually exported from the northeast region. For instance, this Assam lemon, you know, it goes in hordes uh, to Middle East and all that. Then you have this king chili, and there are many products like this which are being actually produced and exported. Uh, they are organic or non-organic. It's difficult to say. Now, one of our friends have raised the land issue. It's a, uh, when you talk about this, uh, you know, foreign farms and all that coming in here. I think land is a major issue here, particularly in the hill states. You have this corporate, uh, you know, community lands. How to transform them into corporate lands is a big issue. Some kind of experiments are going on in the form of leasing out those lands, uh, uh, but I don't know how far that has been actually pervasive. And uh, for if you talk about the, only the plain areas, which are free from this uh, community ownership and all, there actually we don't have that kind of big plots and all that. Uh, so. Somebody was asking about industrialization, why industrialization? Now, big time industries, polluting, which require a lot of land, they may, I mean, like an you know, automobile factory or something may not happen in Northeast. Food processing may take place and other, you know, cleaner uh, or so decentralized kind of industries can come up based on the local resources. Uh, plantation was also mentioned. Uh, we know Assam, the, I mean, Assam was brought to, uh, that time, Northeast was Assam actually brought to the, World map by tree, tea plantation, but tea is now uh, it's facing a sunset. Rubber in certain areas are doing well, but coffee is also beginning to make a mark. So uh, plantation has a, a hope. Then carbon sequestration already ornatural produce because of having a high, you know, sort of uh, forest area is getting some kind of credit because in devolution of funds now the formula now they have done away with the what you call the special category states. But if you have those, if you are border state, if you are environmentally, you get uh, you get some credit, I mean, more weightage. And if you are environmental targets have been met, you know, forest covers and all that, you get extra points. I think our natural produce is already benefiting some kind of, uh, you know, from its high forest covers. But in many other states, the forest covers actually are uh, less than what it should be, particularly for Assam. You know, the forest cover has practically gone. So forest-based industries have closed down. Supreme Court has uh, closed them down. 
But I'm, it's not entirely a negative story, you know, a lot of things are happening at the ground level, agriculture and all that. Now, somebody mentioned about the border trade. This is inter interesting. So I, I know how this impression is gathered that it's a big uh, economy, uh, the border trade. Actually, it is not. If you, I mean, what percentage of, uh, you know, exchanges take place in Moray, that's near Manipur border and all, it's not very large. Even uh, probably it will be significant if you just take Manipur uh, economy, but the whole economy of Northeast, you take, it's not very large. Now, the trade, earlier the trade was just border trade limited to certain commodities. So therefore, all other commodities came through the informal or informal is basically, you can say, uh, an euphemism for smuggling, actually, <laughs> I have to say that. But now, actually, there are no restrictions. You know, I mean, it's basically the typical exim exim uh, policy trade you can uh, do. So, I mean, this is normal international trade you can do in the more border. But if you go there, you'll find that the official channels are empty. Everything is going through the unofficial ch channels, in spite of the fact that India has few, you know, import restrictions now. Um, you can import almost everybody. The problem is that there is a small amount of customs you have to pay. But because I think government of India or local government, whoever, whichever government is responsible, they are not enforcing it strictly. So the smuggle route, even if the, suppose the customs is 5%, if you can avoid that 5%, that can be quite substantial. Fish and all that come from Vietnam and all are quite good quality. Now, of course, there are some other problems there because pulses, India has, India is becoming more and more self-sufficient. Earlier, Burma, has, I mean, Myanmar has a uh, thing kind of, you know, uh, competitive advantage in those kind of things. So pattern of trade is also changing a little. So formalization, I think is all institutional thing has been done. Myanmar's economy now, exchange rate was earlier a problem because they had a fixed exchange system. Now that is also gone. It's a question of enforcing the customs properly. So let the things come through. Maybe the customs can be reduced if we have some kind of bilateral agreement and all that. But uh, but that has to be enforced. You know, customs has to be paid. Some customs are required. All right. So a uh, lot of potentials are there in notice, but there are also a lot of missing links. Many links have been taken care of, but, uh, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of distance have been covered, but there are also miles to go. That's how I'll put it, you know, and, uh, and the last word I'd like to say, I mean, I mean, the, the final word I'd like to say, it's not the last word, obviously, is that employment, again, there is one issue, you know, unless you have this uh, non-government economy also flourishing, and the, the educated people are still looking for a government job. That is something attitudinal issue. And governments are also playing up to them, you know. They say that I'll create 5,000 jobs this month, another one, uh, within a one year, I'll create one black jobs. And these are all government jobs only, you know, the uh, appointment letters and all those things are, are distributed in Stadia and all that. So this, is, I think, is a sending a rather a long, wrong sig signal to the people who even want to become entrepreneurs and so on and so forth. So some, uh, you know, uh, corrections at the civil society, political level and uh, policy level need to be done. And the missing links, I hope, will be covered. And notice, as you say, uh, as uh, Dr. Singh has said, can be an engine of growth for itself, if not for the country, you know. And uh, um, uh, as far as the activist policy is concerned, you know, um, the return of money, military uh, to Myanmar actually is a bad news for the Northeast. And in Bangladesh also, you know, the conditions have deteriorated in last few months, you know. So these are the two states on which, to, uh, through which the Northeast was hoping to get some access. But then in both these uh, states, the environment, the ambience has now somewhat gone down. So I think it will be, be better if Nautis looks itself as an, uh, I mentioned the other day also, as one, you know, economy inside integrated and try to maximize its benefit and then greater integration with the rest of the uh, country's economy. Okay, so I think that is a law, that will be a very uh, viable thing. Then if Actis and other things happen, That'll be better. That'll be a bonus. But as a dividend, I think we should be focusing on, you know, uh, internally integrating and integrating with the rest of India. Uh, with these words, I'd like to thank everybody and hand over my, you know, whatever to uh, Dr. Charan Singh. Yeah, Dr. Charan Singh, I'm done. Hi.
Thank you very much, Professor Vedruva. That's a very good summary. Uh, I still feel that uh, Northeast can serve, you're right, organic farming could be suicidal if we do the Sri Lanka way. But if we're able to market it well and get the Western world interested, maybe the type of things that I have seen coming from Northeast could be very healthy. Now, one question is, and I must thank you, uh, Professor, for sharing your research with us. So beautifully done and summarized it in so short a time, but so very well done. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we have had a good discussion, very rich discussion. And I think we need to look deep, still deep, uh, and further into Northeast, because I think there's lots of potential. From the budget angle, if you have any suggestions uh, and you want to share with us, we are going to have a budget session uh, in January. I can invite you again if you have some suggestions to make from Northeast on the budget. Uh, with this, I would also like to say that today's excellent discussion will be available by tomorrow on our website. And next week, we have Professor Ajit Avar Rai Chaudhary, who's from Jadavpur University. He will be speaking to us about the global situation. And I've heard him speak earlier. It's going to be an excellent discussion. And this is going to be on December 30th, um, the last day of, our, of the year. And I think it's befitting that we close the year and we look at what has happened in the rest of the world, how growth has played out and how India is emerging to be a very important, stable and uh, uh, country with not so high inflation. All those issues are going to be discussed by Professor uh, Ajita Varay Chaudhary. And I would invite you to please come for that session also. With this, let me conclude by uh, thanking everyone, Professor Bezbarua and Professor Ravi Chandra Singh and the participants for making the discussion so rich. Thank you. Thank you sir, so much, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.